Good afternoon. Today we're going to build some virus particles. When we talk about virus structure, first let's think about the proteins that make up the virus particle, what they're doing. Uh, they have a number of functions. They have to protect the genome, of course. That's the main function. This is a model of poliovirus that I have here. It's made of plastic, and it's got the genome in it. It's 7,440 bases. It's the exact sequence. Each of these four beads is the right sequence. Someone made this for me, a virologist, of course. And um, so during the entry lecture, I'll, I'll pull it out. But um, that's what the, the capsid is for, to protect this. Because if it doesn't have protection, it's going to be degraded. So a really important part of the viral shell, the capsid, whatever it might be, to make a protective protein shell. And of course, it has to recognize the nucleic acid genome. You don't want to have cellular nucleic acids packaged. What a waste that would be, right? So you have to have some specific mechanism for ensuring that only viral nucleic acids get in. And we'll talk about those later. And then this, um, some viruses, of course, have an envelope, a membrane around them. We'll talk about that today. And they have to, the structural proteins have to direct that process of acquiring the membrane. So those are some of the functions uh, when the virus particle is made. And of course, when a virus infects a cell, the shell or the capsid has to help deliver the genome. It has to bind cell receptors. And we'll talk today a little bit about the structures involved. But we have a lecture next time devoted to that entirely. Uh, they have to release their cargo. So even though they're ni the genome is nicely packed inside these virus particles, and it's really stable, at some point it has to give up the nucleic acid. Uh, for viruses with membranes, the viral structural proteins have to help fuse the membrane with that of the cell and even help transport the genome to the right place in the cell. So these are lots of different functions for viral structural proteins. Today we're going to be concerned with how to make a virus particle. Uh, and in other lectures, we'll talk about some of the functions of the, of the proteins. But before we do, let's talk about definitions to make sure we're on the same page. First, we have subunit. A subunit of a virus particle is a single polypeptide chain. That's what I mean by subunit. So here on the right is a poliovirus, and its subunits are colored differently, red, blue, yellow. And here they are apart from the virus particle. They're called VP1, VP2, and VP3. VP is a widely used name in virology for virus structural proteins. It means vir virion protein. So each of these is a subunit or a, a single polypeptide chain. Then we have a structural unit. And that can be called either a protomer or an asymmetric unit. And that is what we use to build the capsids or the nucleocapsids. And they can be one protein. Some vi for some viruses, the subunit is the same as the structural unit. Or uh, substructural units can be made up of more than one subunit. So here on the poliovirus structure, uh, one of these structural units is outlined in blue. And you can see it's composed of three proteins, VP1, 2, and 3. That's a structural unit. Then a capsid is the protein shell surrounding the genome. And that poliovirus capsid is diagrammed on the upper right. H here it is on the desk in front. This model is a poliovirus capsid. And next to it is another model of a polio capsid. This is made on a 3D printer. So it's kind of made of a clay substance. Uh, but it's a capsid, all right? That is what I mean by a capsid. There's no membrane on either one of these virus particles, from Latin meaning box. The protein shell surrounding the genome. Then we have nucleocapsid, which is always, every year, a challenge to understand. It's the nucleic acid protein assembly within the particle when it's a substructure. So here, poliovirus is composed of a capsid and RNA genome. This is a capsid. It is not a nucleocapsid because it's not a substructure. If it had an envelope around it, then the capsid inside with the RNA would be a nucleocapsid. Now, you may be thinking that's pretty arbitrary. Yeah, it is, but that's the way some things are in terminology. You just have to remember it. So here on the right is a diagram of influenza virus. It's an envelope particle with eight RNA pieces in it. And 
Each of those RNA is actually an RNA protein complex, and we call that the nucleocapsid. Then we have an envelope, which is the membrane that surrounds a lot of virus particles. Envelope, viral membrane, you can call it several different things. Uh, and that is shown in the influenza virus particle, and at the bottom, a retrovirus particle. Always derived from the host. Viral envelopes always come from the host cell. Viruses do not encode a membrane synthesizing machinery. And then finally, we have the virion, which we've already encountered which I use to mean the infectious virus particle. So a particle you could use, a virus particle could be a word that you use. We have virus particles sitting on the desk here. But a virion I reserve to mean the infectious virus particles. Remember, not every particle in a preparation of viruses is infectious. Some of them are non-infectious. They're defective in some way. They're not virions. Uh, so you've got to remember that, because I try and reserve that for infectious virus particles. Now, when we talk about virus structure, give, let me give you a sense of size, what we're talking about here. Here's some numbers, and I throw around a lot of these terms, especially nanometer, 10 to the minus 9 meters, which is the same as 0.001 micron. A micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters, right? So we use microns and nanometers when we talk about structural virology, and a nanometer is also 10 angstroms. Angstroms is another number that we use, especially when we talk about the resolution of uh, proteins and pr viral capsids. We use angstroms to define that. And just to give you some sense of size and relative sizes, an alpha helix in a protein, show, shown on the right here, is about a nanometer in diameter. A DNA is two nanometers in diameter, so this double helix here, two nanometers. A ribosome is about 20 nanometers, that's figure G here. Poliovirus shown below it is 30 nanometers. So this, uh, this, these two polioviruses on the desk here are obviously different scales, but much, much bigger than the actual size of the particle. You could never see it visually. You need an electron microscope to see it. And then we have Pandora virus, which is the biggest known virus, 1,000 nanometers. It's kind of oblong shaped, as you can see there. That is really remarkable when you consider Polio. So polio is not the smallest virus particle. There are some smaller, about 20 or so nanometers uh, that I know of. So that gives you an idea of the sizes that we're talking about here. Very important concept. Virus particles are metastable. Metastable. What does that mean? It means they have two different states. They have a stable state. And of course, to protect the genome, they have to be stable. They can't fall apart. But at some point, once this virus get in, gets into the cell, the virus has to come apart and let out the genome. And so therefore, it has to be unstable at some point in its reproductive cycle. So that's what I mean by metastable. There are two states. There is a stable state, uh, which these virus particles have in order to spread from person to person. They're very stable. Polio virus is amazing. The way you get polio, you swallow it. You, have, you contact fecally contaminated material. Remember, the world is covered with a thin layer of shit. <laughs> shit is everywhere. <laughs> Not just human, but animal. You know, we uh, have very bad hand hygiene. And then in the old days when polio was around, we used to get it from swallowing fecally contaminated material, mostly kids playing with each other. Very, very bad hand hygiene. You swallow it, it goes through your stomach, which is low pH goes through your intestine, which is alkaline, has bile salts in it, detergents, and then gets into your intestine and infects, and it's stable. In all of that, it's remarkable. So that's the stable part. Yet, this thing will come apart in the blink of an eye. All it needs is a key. It needs a trigger of some sort. I happen to know what the trigger is. It's the receptor. If you add polio receptor to this particle, Boom, it opens up and the RNA comes out. The trigger for different viruses is different, but that's where the unstable part comes from. So now you get a sense for how you could regulate the metastability of a particle uh, just by certain conditions. So another way to look at metastability is in terms of free energy conformation. Viruses have not attained their minimum free energy conformation in their stable state. In order to get to an unstable state, they have to surmount an unfavorable energy barrier. So that's diagrammed here. 
here's our virus particle. One on the y-axis is, is energy state. Uh, and so virus particles exist at some energy level. And to uncode or to become unstable, they have to reach this minimum free energy conformation in three. But they cannot do so unless a trigger of some kind is provided, which I just described for poliovirus, which would be binding to a receptor. And that is because there is an energy barrier that the particle must go over. It just can't get there on its own. It has to be pushed by some trigger. So that means the particle that is stable, these stable virus particles, actually have energy in them, loaded into them during assembly. So during assembly of virus particles, energy is stored in the bonds that comprise uh, the particle. We say that it's spring-loaded to give you the idea that if you can just trigger that spring, the virus particle will pop open. And that energy that is stored in the particle during assembly, during spring-loading, if you have the right trigger during entry of the particle, that energy will be used to disassemble the virus particle because you need some energy to take it apart and that energy is stored in the virus particle uh, during assembly. So that's a little bit of a deeper dive into this whole um, idea about metastability. Now how do we make a metastable virus particle? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this today but it all has to do with these properties here. First, the stable structure, the structure of these virus particles where they're protecting the genome and holding it uh, to protect it against the environment. This is created by assembling a particle with many identical proteins that provide maximal contact. We're going to see how this is done in a bit, but most of the virus particles we know of, not all by any means, but most are made by taking a few subunits and repeating them many times so you get a symmetrical arrangement. That makes a very stable structure because you have lots and lots of the same interfaces in these particles. If you have even one protein repeated 60 times, you could make a virus particle. So you'd have the same interactions throughout the particle. It would be very stable. So that's one way to make a, a stable structure. How do you make it unstable? How do you make it so it comes apart? Well, first of all, these proteins, these 60 proteins or 180, whatever they might be in the particle, they're not covalently bonded. That would be silly. You could never get it apart. You'd need a lot of energy to take that apart, and we typically don't have that built into the particle. So these are non-covalent bonds, and they can be easily taken apart during infection as a consequence to expose the genome. Again, by a trigger of some sort. I mentioned for polio, the receptor. There can be other triggers as well, which we'll find out next time. So let's see if that makes sense. First question is, viral capsids are metastable because A, they must protect the viral genome outside of the cell. B, they must come apart and release the genome into a cell. C, they have not obtained a minimum free energy confirmation. D, they are spring-loaded or maybe all of the above. 89% uh, of you got D, E, all of the above, which is correct. Every one of those statements is correct. And so those are all in, in the previous few slides that I just described to you. They're all part of being metastable. Now today we're going to talk about building different kinds of virus particles. First I want to tell you a little bit about this, the tools that we use to figure out the structures of these particles. They include electron microscopy, x-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, cryo-electron microscopy, or cryo-electron tomography. Uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. I'm going to just talk about the first three very briefly just to give you a sense. If you have the textbook, they're all described pretty well in chapter four. Uh, now, the, the whole era of modern structural virology begins in 1940 with the development of the Uber microscope by uh, Helmuth Ruska. Now, the, the microscope had been invented in uh, Germany, I think, in 1934. If you ever go to Munich, there's a amazing technology museum there and they have the first electron microscope there. They also have a, a iron lung which they used to use to put people in when they got polio. Lots of very cool things. Anyway, he was the first to take pictures of virus particles in an electron microscope. Here's the original paper. I love the Uber microscope. It's great. Anyway, this is the picture he published. It was of a bacteriophage attaching to a bacterium. The bacteriophages are these particles on the top with the 
uh, capsids with, with uh, tails on them. It's diagrammed in the upper right. We'll look at this in a moment. And there's the uh, bacterium. Now remember, up until this point, we discovered viruses at the end of the 1800s. Up until this point, people didn't know they were particulate. They thought they were liquids. So this really said, ah, this virus is not a, a liquid. It's a particle. So this was really important. Now, electron microscopy uh, has its limitations. First of all, biological materials tend to have no contrast. You have to stain them. And you know, if you look at tissues under a light microscope, you stain them with various dyes, different colors, but they don't work in electron microscope because the electrons would pass right through them. So we have to use uh, an electron dense material to stain our virus particles like uranyl acetate or phosphotungstate. And these repel electrons. The electrons don't go through this, so you kind of get a shadow image of your virus particle. That was developed in 1959. So on the bottom here, you can see several different viruses that are uh, visualized in an electron microscope. They're stained, negatively stained, and you, you kind of see a shadow of the particle. On the left here is an adenovirus. It's very distinctive because it has an icosahedral capsid, very much like polio, as you can see, and it has these um, fibers sticking out, which made people think it looked like a satellite. Sputnik, you remember the first satellite launched into space, had these little fibers coming out of it. But you see the stain has stained most of this area and there's a little bit of dark stain in between the subunits. Most of it's white. Uh, and here is also hepatitis B virus uh, negatively stained. This is an influenza virus. Again you can see you see uh, shadows of most of the structural uh, information. On the right is poliovirus. You can see in this preparation by the way there are a couple of uh, what look like empty shells, and that's because they're broken. That's part of the non-infectious particles in that preparation. The resolution of EM is not great, 50 to 75 angstroms. Remember, um, the uh, alpha helix has a diameter of about 10 angstroms, so you can't see any detailed proteins at all. You can see some overall views. You can see what the particle looks like, more or less, but you can't get any uh, detailed structural interpretation. That uh, is left to other techniques, including x-ray crystallography. This is the first technique developed to figure out the structures of proteins and after it had been used to figure out uh, protein structure then people moved to virus particles and this required computers because virus particles were so big compared to a single protein. The first protein crystallized was myoglobin right over in the UK and that was pretty easy but then you come to a virus which has hundreds of copies of the protein you just need a computer to figure it out. But in the 80s, the late 70s, early 80s, it was done, and a number of virus structures were solved by X-ray crystallography. You can get down to two to three angstrom, which means you can see the entire polypeptide, not only the backbone, but the amino acid side chains as well. And the way this works is you have to make a crystal. You have to purify your virus. You have to grow enough of it, purify it, and make it crystallize, which is usually black magic. You've got to figure out all different conditions. Nowadays, they sell kits that you can use to put your uh, crystals, your viruses in all different conditions and you hope to get a crystal and then once you've got it and maybe you've spent a year of your life making crystals then you have to put it in an x-ray source and hope that it diffracts properly and sometimes it doesn't and you've wasted more time so it's a very very tough uh, field to be in uh, but if you do get the right crystals you can uh, shine x-rays on them and then the x-rays will interact with every atom and bounce around and make a diffraction pattern from which you can calculate the original trace of the uh, amino acid background. This is, of course, famous if you've seen the original DNA structure. This is what Rosalind Franklin did with DNA. She made diffraction structures, and Watson and Crick just stole the x-rays off her desk, and they figured out the structure of DNA from her work. And you can do, now in the old days, we used to do this on film. You would have a piece of x-ray film capturing the diffractions, and then you would, uh, trace it somehow, but nowadays we have detectors hooked up to computers that can automatically collect the trace and you can figure out uh, your structure from that. Cryo-electron microscopy came along later much easier. You don't need to make crystals. What you do here is you take your virus preparation, purified virus, and you freeze it. But you have to freeze it really quickly. Last year, the, in full, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was given out to several individuals for perfecting the technique of cryo-EM, including Joachim Frank at Columbia, uh, who figured out a lot of the technique for doing cryo-EM. What you do here is very interesting. You take lots of pictures 
of virus particles, with the idea that each particle is in a slightly different orientation. It's like taking a CAT scan where you lie on a bed and an X-ray uh, machine goes around you and takes pictures and they're all assembled into a three-dimensional X-ray. Here we're doing the same thing for virus particles. You can, take, you can box individual particles and then you do a, a number of computational uh, manipulations involving Fourier transformation uh, and merging these together and eventually you reverse all these and get a 3D reconstruction. So the, the key here is the, is, are the computer programs that take the images, figure out how they're different and build that into a three-dimensional structure. But this can be done very quickly now with very little sample. You don't need crystals. All you need is a, is a good electron microscope. And it started out that these were not very good resolution, but now you can almost match X-ray crystallography in resolution. And this is a slide to, sh to show you the two methods done with poliovirus, because over the years people have used both. On the left, uh, in 1985, poliovirus was the first animal virus whose X-ray structure was determined. And there it is, 2.9 angstroms. You can see every atom basically in three dimensions. You need a computer to build this particular model here. Um, but you could zoom in and see any amino acid that you wanted on the outside or the inside of the particle. And that's how you make these uh, 3D printed viruses now. They're companies online. You just give them this coordinate, this three-dimensional coordinate generated by cryo-EM or X-ray, and you can get uh, an, a virus printed. Uh, on the right is a 20 angstrom structure determined by cryo-EM. And this is an older structure, so not great resolution, but you can see it gives you the shape of the surface of the particle. You can see things like a little star there, right? Five sides. That's the five-fold axis of symmetry, as we'll see in a minute. So you can do things with the, with the high, uh, low resolution structure. But nowadays, cryo-EM is comparable to uh, X-ray crystallography. The background, by the way, is a electron microscope picture of poliovirus. Uh, those are the photos used to generate the cryo EM structure. You take, again, lots and lots of individual pictures, 200 or 300, depending on how uh, good the pictures are. Now, when Zika emerged in 2015 as a global health threat, first in Brazil and then elsewhere, the cryo EM structure was determined within six months by a group at Purdue at 3.8 angstroms. It's amazing what you can do now. And here are two views that I made because I have the coordinates, I can put them into a program on my computer and make very nice pictures. So on the left is uh, the structure where I've made every atom a sphere. Okay, so you can see the little spheres making up the particle. And there are, there's a single glycoprotein on the surface, which is uh, present in dimers. And you can see, you, you can see two green dimers next to each other, but actually it's a green and a red next to each other, a blue and a red, and so forth. And so you can see there's symmetry in this particle, which is quite interesting. We'll come back to this in a moment. And again, another star, five-fold axis of symmetry there. I think you can also see a three-fold axis, meaning there are just three uh, proteins around it. And then this, is, this would be a two-fold axis uh, with a dimer. So that's one view. And then the other view, which I've blown up in the background, I've displayed the, the coordinates as uh, alpha carbon backbones in a ribbon diagram. So you can see um, alpha helices and, and beta turns and so forth. I've left out the side chains in this one so that you can see. And you could zoom in as close as you wanted to and see what kind of interactions are going on. There are actually some side chains here on the surface. You see them? Those are actually carbohydrate modifications of specific amino acids that are thought to be involved in virus attachment to the cell. So having this information is just amazing for many, many reasons. You could figure out how the virus is assembled. You could figure out how it comes apart, how it interacts with antibodies. It's just, an, a, just a gold mine. So having this is, is technology is really great. We can even solve structures now of viruses that are huge. This is cafeteria Rowanbergensis virus, one of the giant viruses uh, that uh, was discovered a number of years ago. It infects a, a eukaryotic, flagellated eukaryote called Cafeteria rowanbergensis, and that lives in the ocean. And uh, this particular structure was solved by Chun Shao at uh, UTEP. He hasn't even published it yet. He says he can't move far enough with it because it crashes his computer every time he tries to manipulate it. It's so big. This particle is 300 nanometers in diameter. It's 10, 
10 times more than polio, and it has over 15,000 uh, capsid protein. So this, he's got this on his website, which uh, is, is all you can get right now because he, he hasn't published it yet. But it's just a tour de force, huge virus. Obviously, it's symmetrical, but you can even work on those uh, as well. Okay, going back to our subway rubric, which is right appropriate here in New York City. The other day, I told you there are seven genome types. And of course, there's a number three train as well here in the subways, because there are three different kinds of virus particles, all right? And uh, what are they? So helical, icosahedral, and complex, which is really a cop-out. Everything else that we can't fit into these two categories, we call complex. And we're going to go through the helical and the icosahedral today. Uh, you can see there, they are symmetrical quite clearly. The complex viruses are, are not really symmetrical. They're, they include pox viruses, the big virus particle on the left here, which has multiple membranes and a funny uh, core inside of it. And then some of the giant viruses, Pandora viruses and pithoviruses, where there's just weird particles. They're very big. There's no symmetry. So we call it complex because we really can't figure out uh, the principles by which they are built. So that's why I say there are three different kinds uh, of particles. Now on the table here today, uh, these four examples are just uh, icosahedral symmetry. And that includes, there are three polioviruses here. And this black one is HIV. Um, can you guess why I have three polioviruses here? Because I love poliovirus. <laughs> it's the virus I worked on my whole career. Okay, so people have given me a lot of these and I, I can't resist buying them. All right, so let's start talking about these kinds of symmetries. The cool thing here is that this is something, another story initiated by Watson and Crick. Remember, they stole Rosalind Franklin's diffraction data. And they figured out the structure of DNA, published it in 1953. They got the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, by that time, she had died. Um, but really, it was her data that gave her. But then years later, they were also interested in virus structure. And they looked at pictures of virus particles that other people had made. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> they looked at pictures of rod-shaped viruses and spherical viruses. And they made two really important conclusions. First, identical protein sub subunits are distributed with helical symmetry for rod-shaped viruses. So this on the left is a EM of tobacco mosaic virus. And this is a rod-shaped virus, it's obvious. And he, they figured out that this is constructed with helical symmetry. And then for spherical or round viruses on the right, that's poliovirus in the EM, they figured out that icosahedral symmetry or platonic polyhedra symmetry was used to construct uh, these round viruses. And that got a lot of people thinking about how this might work. Uh, and the, the a number of individuals came up with these symmetry rules that explain really how viruses are assembled. And rule one in a virus particle, and that is the spherical or even the helical particles, each subunit has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors, okay, either a rod shaped or a spherical virus. Now I have identical in quotes because it turns out as you make bigger viruses, it's not quite identical, but it's quasi identical. We'll get back to that. Uh, you get a symmetric arrangement by repeated interactions of proteins with chemically complementary surfaces. And were they in, they, that's a good way to make a stable particle, as I told you earlier. And so repeating these over and over gets you identical bonding contacts. And then rule two is that contacts are non-covalent. I mentioned that earlier because the virus particles have to come apart. So you have non-covalent bonds. That means it's reversible. So the virus can let go of the nucleic acid. And during assembly, it turns out if you make a messed up particle in the assembly pathway, you could turn it back and reverse it and redo it again. So non-covalent bonds are very important. Now symmetry in self-assembly turns out has practical consequences as well. Because we have a number of vaccines that we make and use, which are called virus-like particle vaccines, in which you simply produce a viral protein and it self-assembles. All the information in that protein for making a virus particle is built into the sequence and the structure of that protein. So, so virus-like particles, they're called, 
an example. There are two examples shown here, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis human papilloma virus. They're both virus-like particle vaccines. Um, and we make these in yeast or other cells. And the diagram on the right shows you an example for the human papillomavirus vaccine. We'll come back to this later on. This is a capsid, a round virus made up of a single protein, major protein called uh, L1. You take the DNA encoding just that protein. You put the DNA in a host. It could be yeast or insect cells. So we have two different a couple of different um, HPV vaccines, which are made either in yeast or in insect cells. All you need to do is have the protein made. It spontaneously assembles into empty capsids, as shown here. And you purify them, and that's what you get when you get vaccinated against these viruses. And there's no nucleic acid in the particle, so it's not infectious. It's a virus-like particle vaccine, so there's no concerns about infectivity, uh, and they're, they're quite good. Knowing about symmetry and self-assembly allows us to make these kinds of vaccines. So back to helical symmetry now, the first of the, of the three uh, different types of virus particle here, the, it, it all amounts to having a coat protein which engage in identical equivalent interactions with one another and with the viral genome. And you get this helical structure. So on the lower right here is another EM of tobacco mosaic virus, the rod-shaped virus particle. Here's a close-up of it on the right. And this is made up of a single protein subunit, or capsid coat protein as it's called here. And these are shown as yellow uh, molecules here. And they interact with each other and with the viral RNA. So these coat proteins encapsidate the RNA. They're protecting it. It's, uh, the, some of them have been removed in this image at the right, so you can see the RNA. But they are wrapped around each other in a helical manner, and that's what helical symmetry gets its name from. Uh, and here on the lower left is another diagram of the individual capsid protein subunits. And then three of them make a turn of the helix, and then you can see multiple subunits joined together. This, these diagrams on the lower left, of course, are without nucleic acid. And so it turns out that Tobacco mosaic virus is built exactly in that manner with this kind of helical symmetry. One protein interacting with each other in exactly the same way, so you get a very stable uh, subunit. There are also viruses of animals that have helical symmetry. Uh, this one is a paramyxovirus called Sendai virus. Here's the, the, the nucleocapsid is longer. Now notice I switched to calling it nucleocapsid. I was calling the tobacco mosaic virus a capsid before. I'll explain that in a moment. This is quite longer, but it, and again, it's a single protein here. The protein is called nucleoprotein, or NP, which is wrapped around it, forming a helix. Identical interactions among the proteins. Proteins also interact, bind with the viral genome, which is a negative strand in RNA. Now at the bottom is an electron micrograph of Sendai virus. And here, these are two particles here. And you can see one of them is broken, so the, the helical capsid is coming out, nucleocapsid. The reason I'm calling it a nucleocapsid is because it's a substructure. The envelope around it makes that into a nucleocapsid. For tobacco mosaic virus, the RNA protein helical structure is a capsid. Here it's a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. For reasons that are not clear, uh, among the animal viruses with helical nucleocapsids, uh, they're all enveloped. None of them look like tobacco mosaic virus. There are no naked uh, helical capsids among animal viruses, but among the plant viruses there are. And here they have an envelope around them, as you can see. Here's another example of a uh, animal virus with helical symmetry in its nucleocapsid. Uh, this is vesicular stomatitis virus, which is related to rabies virus. So people work with VSV. It's not dangerous to people. It can infect them, but it's not dangerous like rabies is. And, and a lot of work has been done with it. And the, the, the uh, particles are bullet-shaped. And within them is a helical nucleocapsid, proteins and RNA wrapped up in this helical structure. Uh, you can see an electron micrograph on the left. This is actually part of the data used for cryo-EM determination of the structure of these particles. Uh, as you can see, RNA bound to this N protein makes up uh, the majority of this particle that swirls around in a helical fashion. There's an interesting cap on one end. It actually comes to a cap and closes this off and makes it bullet-shaped. Uh, and this N protein, which is bound to the RNA, 
uh, is shown on the right side here is the structure of a single uh, monomer of N protein. It's, it's able to bind RNA, nine nucleotides of RNA. And so multiple N proteins obviously interact both with each other and with the RNA to make this nucleocapsid. You can see this ring here is kind of an artificial uh, structure where they took a, a, an RNA bound enough nucleoproteins to make uh, that circle. But of course in a virus particle it would keep going and going. So helical symmetry is quite common among viruses. And again, among animal viruses, those viruses always have envelopes around the nucleocapsid. And here are some negative stranded RNAs, uh, RNA viruses with helical capsids, the paramyxoviruses, uh, measles and mumps virus shown there, uh, the rabies virus as I've just shown you, influenza virus, filoviruses like Ebola virus, they all have a nucleocapsid, a protein RNA structure, which I first showed you in uh, tobacco mosaic virus, but here there's always an envelope around them. For most plus strand viruses, we don't see this. We don't see nucleocapsids, there are a few exceptions. And one of the reasons is the plus strand viruses are ready to be translated when they come in cells. And these viruses being negative stranded, they have to be copied by an RNA polymerase that's in the virus particle and part of this nucleocapsid. In each case, a, a, an RNA polymerase is bound to this nucleocapsid. So again, the nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly packaged within the virion. In these cases, it's a substructure within an envelope. Now, if you have any of these magnets, buckyballs, I have, I have thousands of these because I love building virus particles with them. You can build a really cool uh, helical particle. These are really strong magnets. Uh, you can get in different col colors, you can see. And this is one that I've built and you just put the, uh, you, you get a string of them and you can just wrap them around each other and they make this lovely uh, helical nucleocapsid. So if this were tobacco mosaic virus, that would be the virus particle itself. If it were an animal virus, it would have to have an envelope around it as well. I'll come back to these magnets because you can also, it turns out, make icosahedral particles with them. All right, next question. Which of the following describes virus symmetry and self-assembly? We have the bonding contacts of subunits are usually covalent. B, the bonding contacts of subunits, subunits are usually non-covalent. C, each subunit has different bonding contacts with its neighbors. D, self-assembly of virus particles does not occur. E, none of the above. Most of you got B, bonding contacts are usually non-covalent. That's the only correct statement. Covalent is wrong, they're not covalent. Different bonding contacts. That's the whole point of symmetry. You have identical, in quotes, bonding contacts among subunits. Self-assembly does not occur. It does. I showed you an example of vaccines uh, where self-assembly does occur. So that's why that's the correct answer. All right, so we talked about making helical virus particles. Now let's get to the spherical ones. Now here, the question that Watson and Crick got into and others after them was how do you make a round capsid from proteins that have irregular shapes? So there's an electron micrograph of poliovirus on the left, they're spherical, but the, on the right are, is the protein that makes up the polio capsid. It's not spherical in any way, so how could you do this? And some clues to the answer came from these two bits of information. First, all round capsids have precise numbers of proteins. They're usually multiples of 60. Not always, but they're usually multiples of 60. And number two, these spherical viruses can be many different sizes. They can be tiny or they can be really big, but capsid proteins don't get bigger as the virus particle gets bigger. They're on average, they're 20 to 60 kilodalton in size. So that, those were two clues that were used for the next uh, two investigators, Casper and Kluge. They were structural biologists, really interested in understanding how viruses were built. Uh, they knew from Watson and Crick's work that capsids, round viruses, were made of platonic polyhedra and specifically icosahedrons. There are lots of different platonic polyhedra, but it turns out that to make a round virus, the symmetry that's used is only icosahedral symmetry. So what I mean by symmetry is the way the subunits are joined. For helical symmetry, we already showed, saw that the symmetry is 
wrapped around the nucleic acid. It's, it's a winding molecule which has helical features. For these, it's icosahedral symmetry. And finally, capsid subunits are arranged in groups of five or six pentamers and hexamers. So what does all this mean? So this is an icosahedron, and this is what icosahedral symmetry means. An icosahedron is a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. So on this image here, you can see uh, many equilateral triangles. So there are 20 total making up this icosahedron. Uh, and this lets you make a closed shell that's very stable with only 60 identical subunits. So the smallest virus particles are made up of 60 copies of one protein repeated 60 times. And that's, that you can only do with icosahedral symmetry. And it turns out that the shells you make are very stable. So that's obviously another feature that uh, led to the evolution of this form. Now, when you have icosahedral symmetry, it doesn't mean that the virus is actually a little icosahedron, okay? So you can see polio here has icosahedral symmetry, but it's spherical. And however, this polio virus here, the plastic one, is also spherical. However, the other two, these are giant microbes, you know, these little plushy toys which you can buy everywhere. And I applaud that they want to do this, um, but they have these lines here that imply icosahedral symmetry. That's not so bad, but that's not how polio looks. And it doesn't have eyes either, of course. <laughs> now, this one is really egregious. This is HIV, which doesn't have any icosahedral symmetry, as you'll see. The reason they made it this way, because whoever runs the company uh, went on the internet, and you can find lots of bad images of HIV, which show it as an icosahedral particle. You see the five-fold axis of symmetry? And so they made it wrong. They should have asked a virologist. <laughs> It's not the way it should be. And this has not only eyes, but it's got the little red ribbon as well. They often put these little things, as I said, kids love these. I think it's great to spread the virus word, but I think you should also get it right. All right, so having icosahedral symmetry, that's all it is. It's a, it's a way of arranging subunits. It doesn't mean that the particle looks like an icosahedron. And one of the features is you have axes of symmetry. You have a five-fold axis, which just means there are five faces around the five-fold axis. Two-fold, there are two faces, and three-fold, there are three faces around it as well. Very simple. So how do you use it to build a virus particle? You can start with really simple capsids, which are made of 60 copies of the same protein. And that's the simplest you can make. And here the protein is the same as the structural unit. And they're shown here as a comma. And the interactions of all the molecules with their neighbors are identical. So each of these commas is a protein subunit or structural unit, and they all engage in the same, exactly the same interactions. And that is a small icosahedral capsule. We call this a T equals one. And I'll get back to telling you what that is uh, in a moment. So that's the simplest one you can make. So let me show you an example of a small T equals one virus. This is adeno-associated virus two, which is a parvovirus. These are viruses with single-stranded DNA genomes we'll talk about later, but they're made up of a single capsid protein, 60 copies of it. Here's the capsid protein here, and you can see the particle built on the right from it. So you can easily make um, virus particles with just one protein. But we know all viruses are not small. They get bigger and bigger. So how do you make them bigger? You don't make the proteins bigger. You add more subunits. And the next size up is called a T equals three, as soon as you get away from T equals one, which has 60 copies of a single subunit, you end up having two different kinds of interactions. So T equals one viruses are built solely with pentamers. That is with assemblies of five subunits. But when you start making bigger virus particles, you have a mixture of pentamers and hexamers. That's what you need to do to make a bigger particle. And so here you can see we have some uh, pentamers. There is a pentamer in green, or a five-fold axis of symmetry, if you will. One, two, three, four, five protein subunits around it. The protein subunit here is a comma. And for this kind of virus, the structural unit is composed of three protein subunits. Now, in addition to these pentamers, we also have hexamers. So the hexamers are in gray. You can just see one, two, three, four, five, six subunits around them automatically, without even thinking much about it, you're going to realize that as a consequence, if you have mixed pentamers and hexamers in a particle, you're not going to have 
identical interactions anymore. They're going to be different interactions around the pentamers versus the hexamers. And so that's why I had identical in quotes in that original slide, because here we have an example. And as we make bigger and bigger viruses, it's always the case that you have almost identical interactions. So you get head to head and tail to tail interactions of these commas, but they're in slightly different chemical environments. And so we can't say uh, that they are identical. So this is a bigger virus made of 180 identical protein subunits. So still we are using the same protein, just adding more of it. It's in groups of three instead of one protein being the structural unit as we saw for a T equals one. What I've just told you that the interactions are not identical in that T equals three or bigger virus, we call that quasi-equivalence. It's just a fancy name for saying uh, that when you have a capsid with more than 60 subunits, which we know we have to get bigger particles, each occupies a quasi-equivalent position. In other words, there are different bonding environments. You still have head-to-tail, and head-to-head, and tail-to-tail -tail interactions, but there are different chemical environments dictated by having pentamers and hexamers. That's all you really need to understand about that, and that all the subunits are not exactly in the same environment. So here's an example of a larger virus. It happens to be a T equals six, not a T equals three. But this is SV40, a polyoma virus, which we'll talk about later. It is a, a virus with a double-stranded circular DNA genome, as you can see in the upper right, about 15 nanometers in diameter, so slightly bigger now. T equals six, made up of 72 pentamers of VP1, so it's composed of 360 subunits in all. And so the basic building block here is VP1. So in the image on the right, uh, those are given different colors. So the uh, subunit at the five-fold axis of symmetry, which is all purple, each VP1 is in purple, uh, and that has five neighbors. So one, two, three, four, five, so that's a pentamer. But you also see uh, VP1 pentamers with six neighbors. So there's one right there, and you can count six neighbors around it. So again, each structural unit is a pentamer of VP1, five copies of VP1, one, two, three, four, five in different colors. And they can be in either five-fold surrounded environments or six-fold pentamers or hexamers. And again, these would be, these viral capsid proteins, we would say, have quasi-equivalence in, ter in their terms of their symmetry. Now the T number that I've been mentioning a lot, just want to tell you what it is. It's very simple. It's the triangulation number, which is the number of facets per triangular face of the icosahedron. Remember the icosahedron is made up of 20 triangles. This number simply tells you how many facets there are on the face. So here on the left is a T equals one particle. There's one facet in that triangular face. Here on the right is a t equals four, one, two, three, four facets. So the triangle, the equilateral triangle that makes up this icosahedron is simply divided into facets. We're simply adding more subunits to make a bigger virus particle. So you can safely assume that as you increase the t number, you are increasing the size of the virus particle. And as you do that, you go from t equals one to four. Now you generate a six-fold axis or a hexamer. And so here's a nice slide summarizing what a T number is. So here at the top is a T equals one. That's our virus, the smallest virus made of one structural unit, 60 copies of it. Each uh, icosahedral triangle has one facet. Here T equals three has three facets. One, two, three, you can see them outlined in red. There are 180 subunits. Then we can go T equals four. You can see in red one, two, three, four facets to that uh, triangle, you get 240, and on and on. This one's a T equals 13. You can see it's really big. And you just keep adding hexamers, groups of six, by, to make a bigger and bigger virus particle. You can see you always have 12 pentamers, because you always have 12 five-fold axes of symmetry. And then you just stuff in hexamers around them to make a bigger uh, and bigger virus particle. So back to buckyballs. I'm so excited. Last year, I took a trip to Indiana University, and there was a structural guy there who I figured out how to use buckyballs to make icosahedral capsids. So I rushed home and bought some and made capsids with the idea of, of showing it to you, because I think it really illustrates this way to make a bigger capsid. So here on the left is our smallest possible icosahedral capsid, a T equals one particle, 60 subunits of the same protein, 
and it's all built of pentamers. One, two, three, four, five. Five uh, single proteins. And I've made this T equals one particle with different colors so you can see the pentamers. So there are 12 pentamers, 60 subunits. On the right is a T equals three. All I did was add some hexamers in blue. So we have 12 pentamers that make up the five-fold axes. You add he hexamers in between, you just stuff them in between. Uh, you can see one of them right there. And that gives you 180 subunits. I want to make bigger, I want to see how big I can get this. So I've got even more I, I ordered and they're sitting in my office. But you could in theory keep making it bigger and bigger and then it's just a matter of when it collapses under its own weight. But I think it illustrates really nicely how you get from a small to a big particle. All right, uh, which of the following are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry, viral capsids? A, produces a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. B, allows formation of a closed shell with 60 identical subunits. C, five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. D, the T number describes the number of facets per icosahedral face, and E, all of the above. Most of you got uh, E, all of the above, they're all right. 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle, closed shell with 60 subunits, five, three, and two-fold axes, T number, number of faces, facets of an icosahedral equilateral triangular face. Now, by the way, if you look at this little, this is a printed poliovirus, you can see the five, the pentamers, you can just count five blue copies, one, two, three, four, five, you can see the, the hexamers, one, two, three, four, five, six. So these models are not only beautiful, but they're good for understanding symmetry. Viruses get more complicated than simple icosahedral shells. And let me give you an idea of some of the ways that we do that. Here's adenovirus, which I uh, showed you a picture earlier, is an icosahedral shell with these uh, fibers sticking out from it. This is quite large, 150 nanometers. It's a T equals 25 capsid, 25 facets in the icosahedral face. So we've got lots of hexamers here. Uh, at each vertex or each five-fold axis, you have a pentamer. And it's called an adenovirus, a penton base. And the rest of these subunits are hexons. But at each five-fold axis, you also have a fiber stuck in. And at the end of the fiber, there's a, uh, a knob. And this is how the virus attaches uh, to its cellular receptor. So that's kind of a specialized addition, which is not really part of the icosahedral capsid, but which is added onto it. And there would be 12 of those fibers, of course, because there are 12 five-fold axes of symmetry. So that's what I mean by distinct components with different symmetries. There are also other proteins in this capsid that have special roles that don't fall into the symmetry. Uh, for example, there are lots of proteins inside the capsid, but within the capsid itself, you can see protein 3A, protein 9, et cetera, these have other roles. One of these is thought to be a glue that holds the capsid together because as you get bigger and bigger, it's harder for it to stay together. And uh, you need some other proteins in there to cement them together. You know, the main proteins making up the capsid are the pentamers and the hexamers, but there are some other proteins thrown in as well for various roles. So that's one example. Another interesting example are real viruses where you have two icosahedral shells. There's one inside and one on the outside. And that's shown diagram diagrammatically on the left. Uh, you have one shell in kind of a tan color and a second shell in the purple color. This, by the way, is a virus with double-stranded RNA segments. We'll come back to this. Uh, on the right are the two different shells whose structures were solved. Uh, on the left, the outer shell, which consists of BP7 trimers is a T equals three, 13 arrangement. Uh, and on the right is a T equals two arrangement. This is the inner shell. So the two shells have different symmetries altogether. It's concentric shells. There's an inner one, there's a genome, an inner shell, and an outer shell. Now you may think, why does this virus need two shells? Well, it turns out there's a, there's a function. This protects the virus as it goes through the intestinal tract. And when the outer shell is taken off inside the cell, that makes the inner shell primed for entry. And we'll see how that works uh, next time. You can even add symmetries together to make different virus particles. So here's a tailed bacteriophage. This is a virus that infects bacteria, of course. And you, you have certainly seen pictures of this. Not all phages look like that, but this is a pretty cool one. The head, of course, is an icosahedrally symmetric capsid. It's built using this, the uh, principles that we've just talked about. And it is attached at one of its 
uh, five-fold axes of symmetry. You can see them darkened on the picture on the left there. It's attached uh, to the tail. And the tail has elements of helical symmetry. That idea of wrapping around a protein it doesn't have DNA in it there, but it's, it's helical symmetry. Then you have a base plate. So the DNA of this particular phage resides in the head, which is blown up on the right there in the center. You can see uh, pentons and hexons very clearly in that image, and some other proteins as well. When these phages attach to a bacterial cell, they attach via the base plate, and the DNA comes through uh, from the head through the uh, tail, and it's injected into the host. And the DNA is packaged in these heads at really high pressure, amazingly high pressures. And when they attach to a cell, the uh, base plate pokes a hole in the bacterial cell, and the DNA comes whooshing out into the host cell. On the right here in panel C is a blow up of this base plate. That's what is sitting down on the bacterial surface. Now within this base plate is also an interesting structure, and I'm gonna show you that. So here's again the, the tailed <coughs> bacteriophage sitting down on a host surface. Uh, a number of these phages, but not all of them, when they sit down on a bacterium, the tail contracts and out comes a spike which punches a hole into the bacterial membrane. And not too long ago, the structure of the base plate was solved by cryo-EM, and it revealed uh, the spike of this particular phage here. So on panel B, you can see we have sort of an underview of the base plate, and you can see the red spike there. So again, the idea is that that pokes a hole into the bacterium. It then has to go away. We're not sure how that works, so that the DNA can come through. But these, uh, this group figured out the structure of just the spike on its own. That's in panel C. Look at that. It just looks like a spike. So, you, know, you know, we didn't invent anything with knives and spears. Uh, biology invented it a long time ago. So it's exactly as you would think, small at the tip and thicker at the top for structural rigidity. And it's composed of three copies of a single protein, which is shown on the right. They're colored red, uh, blue, and green. And, you know, the top part is all beta sheets, so you have a strong top of this spike, and then it tapers down at the bottom, just and there's no more beta strands. But then uh, there's an iron molecule, which you can see in orange there, that holds the three subunits together. So they're, they're bonds between the protein uh, and the iron molecule, and that holds, it makes it a strong spike. This is just beautiful form and function here, and that's how this thing can poke into uh, the bacterial membrane. So there are lots of, in addition to the symmetries, that I've been telling you about, there are lots of specialized functions uh, as well. Here's another really interesting one. This is herpes virus. And this is a pretty big DNA virus, which, which all of you have. And uh, it consists of a nucleocapsid, which is basically a capsid that's shown in B here, built with icosahedral symmetry. It's big, so it has both pentamers in red and hexamers in purple. And the this is a nucleocapsid because it's encased within an envelope. It's a substructure. Um, and uh, the cool thing about this, you know, it's got five-fold axes of symmetry, but one of them is actually a portal. One on every particle is a portal, which you can see in this EM, they've labeled the portal with uh, gold-tagged antibodies because the portal is made of certain different proteins. And this is a model of the portal in the middle, and on panel D, you can actually see that's one other five-fold axis of symmetry has a, has a hole in it. And that's how we think the DNA gets into the particle when the particle is being built, and how it comes out most likely when the virus infects the cell. So that's a really cool way to take care of virus in and out, DNA in and out of the particle. You know, it's interesting how it gets built because it's not symmetrical, obviously. It's just one of the five-fold uh, axes of symmetry. Now, I, someone not too long ago gave me a keychain, a herpes virus keychain. I wanted to show this to you because it really illustrates perfectly this symmetry or nucleocapsid. Here on the top is the particle. It's the envelope we're looking at with proteins stuck in it. You can see them. We haven't talked about that yet, but whenever a virus particle has an envelope, it has to have glycoproteins in the envelope so they can recognize the host cell. And uh, then you can actually open up this thing and inside is the nucleocapsid. Of course, inside of that is the DNA. And you can see the pentamers. There's the portal at the top. It's got the hole in it for the DNA to go in and out. And you can see 
Another pentamer down there, you can tell by the star shape, and then all these others are hexamers. So exactly the way I told you uh, that these viruses are built. If you have a membrane, you can have icosahedral particles that are naked in the case of poliovirus and many other viruses, but you can also, for other viruses, you put a membrane around it. And that's what I'm telling you about here. Uh, this happens to be a retrovirus illustrated here, acquiring its membrane at the surface of the host cell. But many, both helical and icosahedral viruses have membranes around them. And remember, the membrane is always a lipid bilayer that comes from the host, always, because we don't have any uh, genes for making lipids in virus particles. And the, em the envelope is acquired by what we call budding. The nucleocapsid forms underneath the membrane, and then the whole structure buds out. We'll look at this more in more detail uh, later on. In this illustration, the budding is happening at the plasma membrane, but it can happen at many other membranes in the cell as well. Nuclear membrane, ER, uh, the Golgi membrane as well. And remember then, there's nucleic acid within the envelope. That nucleic acid, we call a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure, can be helical or icosahedral in its symmetry. And here is a helical uh, nucleocapsid in this retrovirus. Whenever you put a membrane around a genome, a virus genome, you have to have proteins in the membrane so that the virus can recognize a host cell. If you just had naked membranes, it could probably still get into cells, but it would be rather random. This way, if you put glycoproteins in the membrane, you can specify what cells are going to be infected. So typically, these viral membranes have what we call integral membrane glycoproteins. And they usually consist of an ex ectodomain or an external domain a transmembrane domain, and an internal domain, uh, which is involved in assembly. So at the diagram on the right is a typical uh, integral membrane, like a protein is the viral membrane there, transmembrane, internal, and external domains. And uh, these external domains, of course, are involved in attachment to cell receptors, but when you make an antibody response against an infection, a virus infection, antibodies are directed against uh, these external glycoproteins, and they're very important for blocking virus infection. So on in the middle is a diagram of influenza virus where you can see the membrane is, is in a tan color, the nucleocapsid is inside, there are eight pieces to this nucleocapsid, and then there are a number of different kinds of membrane glycoproteins uh, in different colors. Some viruses have one kind of glycoprotein, others have multiple. In most cases, these proteins oligomerize. And so they form what we call spikes because when they were first observed in the electron microscope, like this influenza virus at the left, they looked like spikes. So people initially called them spikes and then we realized they were multiple subunits of, of various proteins. So for example, the main spike in these influenza virus particles is a trimer, consists of three uh, polypeptide chains. So always have viral envelope glycoproteins. These glycoproteins, can be oriented in two different ways. They can be sticking up in the membrane or they can be laying down on the membrane. So the sticking up one here is the influenza virus hemagglutinin. This is a protein we're gonna hear about a lot, hemagglutinin or HA. It is perpendicular to the membrane as you can see and it's also a trimer. You can count three red bundles there. It's a trimer of a single protein. And again, that studs the influenza virus particle. You can see it here in blue. And uh, this is very important for biological functions of the virus particle, which we'll talk about later. In contrast, many viruses, the glycoproteins actually are flat on the surface, which is weird, but it works. So it's not a problem. And here, this is as an example of the E glycoprotein of flaviviruses, of which Zika is a member. Zika is a flavivirus. Uh, it, it's glycoprotein is called the E glycoprotein for envelope and it exists as a dimer, you can see orange and yellow, and it's flat on the surface. And again, at the lower right, that's the structure of Zika virus that I showed you earlier. And each of these proteins that make up uh, the surface are arranged as dimers, and they're lying flat on the surface. You may be looking at this and saying, but that, that's an enveloped virus. Why is there icosahedral symmetry? And that's a really good question. It must be that for these viruses, the proteins on, that are lying flat on the surface can interact with each other using the same principles uh, 
that are used to build icosahedral capsids. And that's why you see a five, a three, and a two-fold axis of symmetry. There are other envelope viruses where the underlying capsid has icosahedral symmetry, and because the glycoproteins interact with it, they also have icosahedral symmetry, but that doesn't seem to be the case uh, for these flaviviruses. So in some cases, the glycoproteins themselves can uh, orient uh, with the principles of icosahedral symmetry. And this uh, brings us to another kind of distinction we can make between viruses with envelopes. We have those that are unstructured and those that are structured. So typically, uh, viruses with helical nucleocapsids that have an envelope on them, and all the animal viruses do, here's influenza at the left, and Ebola virus at the right, these envelopes are unstructured. If you look at the glycoproteins, they're not arranging with any kind of symmetry. HIV is, is one of these unstructured envelopes, and that's why I told you before that fuzzy uh, giant microbe HIV is wrong because it's, it's giving it icosahedral symmetry. It shouldn't have any. All right, so helical nuclear capsids, unstructured envelopes. Basically, you look at the glycoproteins. Let's go back to this picture of influenza virus. You can't see any symmetry in those glycoproteins. However, on the right, the flavivirus glycoprotein is clearly symmetrically arranged with icosahedral symmetry, because you can see five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. And so, as I said, some viruses have icosahedral nuclear capsids within the envelope, and that confers icosahedral symmetry to the glycoproteins. The Zika and the Flavies don't seem to do that. There are other groups of viruses where that occurs here. These proteins in themselves have the ability to interact with each other uh, as if they were in a uh, icosahedral capsid. Now the last group of those three, we have helical, we have icosahedral ways to build particles, and this is the complex virus particle, which is a big cop-out right, because we don't really understand how they built, so we just put them all in a separate group. And they include uh, pox viruses. You can't see any symmetry in any of these, uh, really. Uh, Pandora virus on the lower left, you know, big double-stranded DNA with kind of a flask-shaped particle, a little pore at one end, no symmetry. Uh, and at the right, pithovirus, where, again, a large DNA genome in an amorphous particle. The one cool thing here is that there is this interesting structure at one end, which has been called the cork. Uh, and they think that this comes out to let the genome uh, out of the cell. But there's no symmetry here. Uh, they're built very much like cells, we think, and each one is probably different. All right, let me end by just telling you that we've talked mainly about the structural components of virus particles that make the shells or the helical uh, nuclear capsids or the glycoproteins. But there are many other proteins in virus particles that don't contribute to the structure, but they have other functions. And they're all shown here. And we're going to come back to many of these. Many virus particles have enzymes of various sorts, whether they're polymerases, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, proteases, uh, various enzymes to participate in nu nucleic acid metabolism. Uh, some viruses have um, proteins that are important for production of messenger RNAs. And many viruses incorporate cellular components like histones, tRNAs, lipids of various sorts, and much, much more. So just remember that the structural components are one thing to build a particle. Then we have uh, many other components, but these are important for the reproductive cycle as well. So now you know how to build a virus. You could build one on your own. I bet you could get some buckyballs and build a helical or an icosahedral particle. Next time, we'll figure out how to take them apart and get to that unstable part to let go of the genome.